Come on, let's make some noise in here, Rainbow Push. We're excited about our upcoming Wall Street event next month. We are excited about the work of Rainbow Push, all the wonderful things that the organization does around the country and around the world. We thank God for Reverend Jackson and his vision on all things important, all things valuable. Even here on All-Star Weekend, he's making an impact. So we love you, Reverend. Thank you so much. We heard from our national spokesperson, uh, Jonathan Jackson. We bless uh, God for you. And this amazing panel here today, these are some athletes that do much more than play on a court. They have an impact around the world in their communities and in the work that they do. I'm going to ask each of you to just give us a quick introduction as to who you are just so we can educate the crowd and maybe a few folks that are a little older than you and maybe not saw you play in your playing days. So give us a little quick background on your playing days as well as what you're doing now. Jonathan, we'll start with you just giving us as well as your background too. I'll start. Uh, Jonathan Jackson, a wannabe athlete my entire life. Uh, this is one of the highest honors I could have is to be on the stage with these great athletes. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm always thinking ladies first, so you, oh, you go oh, ahead. That's so sweet. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Nakia Sanford. I am an 11 year veteran of the WNBA. I played 14 years total uh, professionally around. Oh, thank you. Um, native of Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. Uh, Antonio Davis, uh, 16 years of professional basketball with the Pacers, the Raptors, the Bulls. Um, I born and raised in Oakland, California, and um, I'm, I'm really excited and thankful to be here today. My name is Aton Thomas. Uh, played 11 years in the NBA. Uh, right now, I'm a, I'm a uh, writer and a motivational speaker, and I'm speaking in colleges across the country. We had a great event yesterday at Collins High School. Shout out to Collins High School. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Of course, we uh, are excited about Eton and his book. We brought this book with us. We want to make sure that all of our student athletes in the room get this book, We Matter, Athletes and Activism. Give Eton a hand just for being able to put his thoughts to paper in a, in a magnificent way. And I want to start with you, Eton, because of that. This panel really is a part of the ongoing work we're doing with you, supporting the Eton Thomas Foundation and your work around the country, going to schools, colleges. You've been at Harvard. You've been at USC. You've done all these wonderful appearances about the fact that we matter. Talk a little bit about your uh, motivation behind writing this book and what it means to say athletes and activism. Well, one of the things that I wanted to do with the book was to capture a lot of the activism that was kind of exploding onto the scene recently. Um, and then, of course, I had to go back and, and, and interview the different people that I grew up uh, admiring and grew up reading about. So Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and uh, Craig Hodges, who was at the panel that we did yesterday morning at, at, Collin, at uh, Collins High School. And, um, you know, John Carlos. So all those athletes that I grew up admiring, the way that they used their position in the platform to be able to speak on social issues and make an impact into the country. Uh, so then I wanted to uh, capture some of the the activism that was going on currently. So I knew you like D. Wade and Carmelo Anthony and Eric Reed, who was kneeling the entire time with Colin Kaepernick and, um, you know, Swin, Swin Cash and Tamika Catchings and, you know, everything, the incredible thing that they did with the WNBA when they all banded together right. in, in protest, which is absolutely amazing. And, you know, I used that to really, um, you know, inspire younger athletes and younger generation, especially, to continue using their voices and their platforms. So not just athletes, but just the entire younger generation. Generation. Right now, I think we're at a great time where young people are using their voices. And a lot of times that, that's because they have social media. Mm -hmm. And they're using it in a way that's so effective. And it's really beautiful to see. So I really wanted to just capture that and continue to inspire young people. Not necessarily just who will all agree with me. Mm -hmm. You know, in my positions. I have specific positions that I am very vocal about. But it's not just including people who, who you know, encouraging people who agree with me. Just the fact that they have the right to be able to voice their opinion, mm -hmm. their voice, and that their voice actually matters. Nikia, you're amening uh, Eton as he goes along there. Some of the things that he mentioned, even about the WNBA and the voice of the woman athlete, which oftentimes gets forgotten even beyond just the African-American or the, or the minority athlete. Talk a little bit about you know, what this means to you to have a platform and to use it to impact what you're doing and what your sisters are doing as well. Yeah, I was, I was very proud um, of the way we handled... Um that whole situation, um, as far as we, you know, banded together and watching that was um, awesome. This is my fifth year retired, so um, being able to see my sisters um, make a big impact was very important. 
Um, this weekend has been pretty amazing. Collin, the Collins High School um, event yesterday really uh, educated me on a lot of things. I learned a lot. So it's been, um, it's been a great um, um, transition with our new CBA. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the WNBA just signed a new CBA that gave maternity leave, which was huge. Um, yeah, it's big. Because um, we, we, we face specific challenges as women, um, being athletes that we're, I mean, we had, I had a basketball sister who actually hid her pregnancy so that she could finish out the season. Like we shouldn't have to put ourselves at risk in those kind of uh, situations. So the, 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 bar, the bar is being pushed forward and I'm very excited about it. That's great. I mean, it's just amazing that you are so conscientious and that's something that I appreciate all of you athletes about. And Antonio, we've had a chance to work. We both from the Bay Area got to represent, right? And the work we've been doing recently with computer labs and different things, talk a little bit about what it means to go back to your hometown and to have the kind of impact you're having with Hip Hop TV, with other community organizations that are doing some major work with you and other athletes. Well, for me, um, I knew that there were certain people in certain situations that allowed me to be what I am today. Um, I know park and recreation for a lot of us was kind of where we were started. Um, we were introduced to so many different sports. We were mentored by so many men and women. We were protected from the elements because of the building. And today when I go back to Oakland and I don't see that, it kind of breaks my heart because the young people are being pulled in so many directions with social media, with all kind of things we know that are in the streets. So I wanted to make sure that um, we kind of balance the playing field a little bit um, with things that they're attracted to, uh, whether it was technology or basketball or whatever it may be, we have to give them other options. There are too many negative options out there. There's not enough people going back and mentoring and showing them uh, that they can dream and there is hope. Uh, you just got to keep pushing forward. Uh, but it's, it, it's my responsibility as it was for people before me to continue to um, make sure that there's a path, make sure there's a safe place, make sure that there's people, make sure that there's opportunity. So that's why we, we did our basketball camp and we had all those other elements in because we got to pull them in. We got to give them something, a reason to come into the building and while we have their attention, we got to tell them that it's okay to dream, it's okay to fail, it's okay to do a lot of things, but we have to pick ourselves back up. We have to go out there and we have to keep pushing through. Excellent, excellent. That's right, that's right. This weekend, we're all here in Chicago for the All-Star Game and for the All-Star activities, and you all have been a part of so many wonderful things. And um, this weekend, we, we cannot bypass the weekend without reflecting, as Reverend did earlier, uh, on Kobe Bryant, who was much more than an athlete himself. Uh, talk a little bit, uh, starting with Nakia, because you mentioned this a little bit earlier in the week, uh, about his impact off the court on the sports world, in particular, uh, his impact on the WNBA as a dad, as well as an icon who just believed in the woman's sports. Yeah. I I, um, I feel like Kobe was one of the first NBA athletes to make it cool to go to W games. You know, he would always be in there and he would be in there um, specifically with his daughter and the, his, that loss of him and Gigi and of course the others that um, lost their lives as well. Um, that in particular hurt us and I've talked about it with a lot of my basketball sisters because we were so excited about seeing her transit. I mean, she was a baller. So we were super excited to see that transition and what that would do for the women's game because there are um, men who have sons that play and, you know, just to see a legacy. We have opportunity for legacy now um, in the league. And so it was, it was very impactful. And he was such a humanitarian, such a good guy. And uh, we, I don't really... I don't, I've never gotten so impacted by a celebrity passing, and I, I was that hit so different. Sure. Um, so we definitely feel that, um, okay. and what he did, I'm sure, will continue. Right. I'm sure. Right. Etan? Well, you know, just we're just fresh out on the way up here. I was actually giving a pep talk to my daughter, who's going to play uh, her volleyball tournament this weekend. Uh, shout out to Metro Metro East. Got to shout them out. Shout them out. Shout and them out. so, so I was telling her that when she steps on on the court, to have the Mamba mentality. And when you step on the court, that means that when you step on and you don't think that anybody else on there can beat you. Mm -hmm. And no matter what they do, no matter how much you fail, no matter how much you fall, you always get up and you know that you are going to be victorious. So yesterday when we was talking at Collins High School and I was talking to this young man afterwards and I asked him what Mamba mentality meant to him. Mm -hmm. And I explained that to him and then I related it also to life. Mm -hmm. And I said in society, there are going to be people who, who are dedicated to you failing. 
-hmm. and you have to be dedicated to say, I'm not going to fail regardless, right. no matter what comes against me. And then that's the mama mentality that you're going to be successful. And I'm, I'm going to keep using that. For, I, I coach my, my son's AU yeah. team, so they're going to hear this a million times. But I just think it's a great, it's a great mentality for young people to really yeah. capture, you know, both, both in sports and in life. And that's just the way that you could use sports to really benefit you um, and, and help you out through your everyday life. Right. Antonio? Man, Kobe Bryant. Um, like, I, I just admired how um, he took hold of life after the game was over. Um, so many times we give our lives to the sport. Um, we, we dig in, and every single day we're practicing to get better. We're practicing to perform. And then when it's over, the only thing we want to do is step off that stage and be as normal as possible. Um, we want that life where we can go back and coach our kids. Um, we want that life where we can go back and support uh, the people that helped us. And to watch him do it so gracefully and do it in a way that, to make guys proud to be uh, fathers of daughters. Um, I can remember going to so many tournaments and having these questions come up. Man, I wonder how many miles I've driven to take my daughter or my son to a basketball game or a sporting event. Um, I lived here in Chicago and we drove everywhere. We, 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 I ended up having to buy a van because we had so many kids we pile in and stay at our house and, and things of that nature. So I can only imagine what he was getting ready to embark on. And I believe, just like you said, he was going to impact everybody, um, get guys to start buying WNBA teams or whatever the case may be. So we, we lost something there. And um, as Rev keeps saying, we have to replace it. We have to find others to get involved. Um, I'm there. My daughter plays for the Dallas Wings. So I go to a lot of games and I make sure. Uh, thank you. Um, you make sure that you're there and you're present and you make sure that you're supporting. Um, but in this time, um, and the last thing I'll say is um, I can't imagine, I can't imagine um, being in that position and wanting to uh, just be normal. Like, I just want to be a husband. I just want to be a father. That's all I want to be. And, um, and then it's gone. So it, it, it taught me to really get up every day and be very grateful and be very thankful yes. and to call my kids and just say, man, I love you, or, or text them and just say, because we can't think that we're going to continue to have that opportunity. We, we don't know when that opportunity is going to be gone. So I encourage each one of you, if there's somebody that you love, if there's somebody that you care about, um, don't take it for granted that you're going to have another moment. So you tell them that you love them. You tell them that you care about them. Uh, and, and make it mean something. Don't just say it just to be saying it because you really don't know. You really don't. Yep. Jonathan, um, um, as, as fathers, you know, and I know I've been able to go to sporting events with you and your children. Um, some of what we talked about here today really impacts us, whether we are athletes like them or wannabes like us. Um, but we understand what it means to be present and then to have the platform to speak life into the lives of younger people. You're with students all the time. You're a professor. You're around young people. Talk about the impact that athletes do have on the lives of young people because you see it firsthand and you understand it much better than most. Well, one part of being an athlete, it's a gift that you can't determine your height, you can't determine your speed, your acuity, your sense, your timing, that not only do these persons, and they, I must say, they're more talented than me, when you're able to have 10 seconds to see the whole court, to make your decisions, pass, shoot, fake, whatever, in any sport, be it tennis, soccer, or basketball, these are extraordinary human beings. And so the world, idolize them and they move towards them. I want to first give a very special heartfelt appreciation to the mother and father of Kobe Bryant. Yeah. That um, yeah. Kobe was not hatched, Kobe was born and to be 17 years of age and to be able to get on one of the most um, competitive fields in the entire world and to continue to grow in grace and strength and speak five languages, play chess, play piano. His parents poured an extraordinary amount of their love and effort into that vessel and into that child. 
also would like to say, um, and I mentioned your name specifically, Brother Davis, I'm sorry, I don't know all the background on your other stories, but in many ways, you are a trendsetter for Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. Your daughter went on to play for a national championship basketball team. Your daughter is in the WNBA. You are a trendsetter, and so I don't look beyond that on the achievements that you've made on and off the court. I'd also like to say that, um, like we're talking about now, the legacy of these parents and their children knowing the path and the route to get into the NBA, the WNBA, and do great things athletically. There's another path. The owners of the Bull, his son is, in, is now the president en route to own the Chicago Bulls in the Davros Mavericks in the New York uh, uh, Yankees and the Giants and the, and the Knicks and so forth. We're not on that trajectory yet. We have many more obstacles to go through. Why don't these people that own the teams, why, number one, don't they have the right to invest in the team that they play for? That's called equity stock ownership. Why do they write the rules to say they can't own where they work? You can do it at Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, any other bank. But it's a rule that says you can. Number two, these are privately held organizations that get public funding. And number three, that we always have to be conscious of, yeah. as soon as our talent is, all, is uh, cultivated and developed, these persons that speak out, speak up, and set the example, they try to knock them out of our children's eyesight. They don't want the persons on this stage to be on the university platforms. They don't want to see them on the ESPNs. They don't want to see them speaking truth to our children. So we have to give extra prayers, extra love to all of those that are willing not to go with the grain, but to cut the grain and make a difference. Well said, well said, Jonathan, well said. In this last quick question for uh, our athlete activists, uh, just share, because we have students in the room, we have students that will be watching this, that are all watching this now live, uh, just give a message, a 30-second message to young athletes, student athletes, because really that's the term we've used so much, and I think it's apropos. Uh, speak to that student athlete and give them a, a message of motivation, inspiration, insight as to how they can move forward from today, hearing your voice, what they can do to make themselves greater. Okay, um, well, the message that I give a lot of young people is um, allyship and how important allyship is. A lot of times people move, um, you know, by themselves. You know, it's funny, I, I was just watching a, a Selma with my, my daughter, Baby Sierra, and in, in the movie, you understand, remember the part where they was just about to cross around Edmund Pettus Bridge and it was this big dramatic scene and the police came and, you know, it was all, she was like, oh my gosh. She was like, are there any good white people in this movie? And I was like, what, 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 just keep watching. My, my, my daughter, she talked through the whole movie. And so I'm like, well, just keep watching. She's like, yeah, but all of this because they wanted to vote? I was like, yeah, just keep watching. So then it came to the part where they reached out to the clergy from all over the country, right? And so all of the white clergy and all the different allies came and they all stood together and the police reacted completely differently. And I say that to say, that, uh, draw the point that allyship is so important. There's so many things that, that we, we need, we need uh, male athletes to be able to advocate for the different things that you're going on in the WNBA. I didn't even know that, what she just said about maternity leave. That's, not, that's something that should have been written in a long time ago. Right. And then we have to be able, as men, to be able to stand up and say, wait a minute, that's not right. This is even on the table, you know what I mean, of an issue that they have. So the importance of allyship is, is so important. One organization helps another organization. It might not be the issue that you're necessarily dealing with, right, you know what right. I mean, but you could have the empathy to say it's not right that they are dealing with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Nakia, go yeah. ahead. I mean, a rising tide raises all ships. So to that point, um, for me, I think uh, purpose, like really understanding your purpose. A lot of times once that ball's gone flat in whatever sport you're um, associated with, you don't have a sense of purpose because your purpose was to wake up and practice and play games. So just understanding what your purpose is while you're playing so that when you retire, you have something else to hold on to. There's no uh, word for retirement in the Bible, right? So purpose yeah. is something that doesn't, that transcends sports, school, whatever it is, you're still living in your purpose regardless of what you actually do physically. So that's important. Outstanding. More than playing ball is in the industry. Mm -hmm. this, this week there'll be maybe 30 players playing with thousands around the city lawyers, that's ad right. agencies, marketing, the whole range of the industry. Right. That, that's what excites me about what Anton is doing and, 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 right. and, 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 and the care is that 
that beyond the, the field, beyond the court, there's an industry. That's right. right. That's right. Reverend Jackson, uh, as, a lot of times people see Reverend Jackson at all-star games and Super Bowls and different things, and they think he's just a big fan, which he is. But really, he spends days in advance of those activities meeting with the teams, meeting with executives, and talking about the business of sports. And I want to just give a mad shout out to Reverend Jackson for seeing beyond the court. And so by the time a lot of folks see him, you know, out at shoot around, you know, talking to the players, he's already met with the president of the team, the owners of the teams, and the you know, commissioner and everyone else about opening up jobs, opportunities, because there may only be 15 people on the bench, but there are 300 people running the arena. And so that means that there are more jobs to be had in the business of sports. You know, you, you have to watch rules. One rule for if you're in college until recently, if you're number one, you made the jersey famous, you can't sell your own jersey. Right. And, and for example, that's changing now. But uh, partly, if, if you get a $50 million dollar country, why can't you invest your money in your team? That's right. Well, why are you exempt, exempt from spending your money on your sport? That's right. That's, that's, that's another hurdle we must cross over. Jonathan articulated that so well, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, Antonio, I appreciate about you, you, you're building generational impact. And so when we talk about what we're, you know, kind of rapping with, but more than that, you, your daughter is blessed, impacted because of your path, and I think that's part of the responsibility, regardless of your career. So talk a little bit about that, just as a father, as well as an athlete, what it means to set a path for your children to follow and to go forward successfully. I think the key point there is just having a path. Um, my kids didn't start off playing basketball at all. I don't even know how they ended up playing basketball. We were in Toronto and all they had was these cold weather sports. So we stayed in the snow. They were snowboarding and doing all this stuff. They played soccer, baseball. I wanted basketball to be the last sport because I didn't want anybody saying I pushed my kids to play basketball. Uh, I gave them all kind of balls. In our house, we had everything for them to choose what they wanted to do. Uh, and then I just gave them a safe place to make that decision and, and go forward. Uh, I'm very excited that they wanted to <laughs> play ball because uh, it, it allowed me to uh, coach them and do some different things. And the one thing I, I'll always remember, um, it was so different with my daughter than it was my son. Uh, my son earlier, we butted heads, and then I had to back off and allow him to be from afar. With my daughter, we spent more time talking about different things and, and doing some other things, and then it was, when it was time, we kind of agreed, oh, Daddy, I don't need you no more. I got it. I got it. You go ahead. Uh, so uh, I love the fact that, you know, for me, it was, it was that bonding experience of being in their lives at such a critical time where they needed some guidance and things of that nature. Um, and I, I always tell them um, social media is just so powerful. So make sure that when you type something up before you hit send, make sure that it represents you and your thoughts. And not just at that moment, not just at that moment, because feelings are all over the place. So I felt one thing at this point in time, I might feel something different. So make sure that it represents who and what you are. And lastly, we're not gonna let sports define us. Yeah. It's just what we did. It's just something that we excelled at and we wanted to do. And like Nakia said, there's a bigger purpose for us. We just have to now take this platform and use it um, for the ways that's going to inspire and, and make paths and give people hope. So that's what we're going to be doing. That's outstanding. Give them a hand of appreciation, everybody. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to let you uh, give us a final uh, uh, word as we wrap up. But you mentioned um, Kobe Bryant's parents. Uh, tomorrow, and this is something a part of uh, Reverend Jackson's vision. Uh, several years ago, we did uh, an event in Silicon Valley with the mothers of the NBA. Uh, tomorrow, the fathers of the NBA are having a gospel lunch, and I want to invite all of you uh, to the HVAC pub, which is at 3630 North Clark Street here in Chicago, uh, beginning at 1 o'clock, uh, with gospel artists and, and local artists. Dietrich Haddon will be the feature uh, performer at the gospel event tomorrow at 1 o'clock with the NBA fathers, and so the fathers of the NBA players are going to be there and they want to just celebrate uh, this weekend too, but also celebrate uh, the goodness of God in the midst of it all. We can't uh, stop being grateful because they are gifts from God, as you said. Uh, but Jonathan, just give us a final word as we wrap this panel and appreciate not only what these folks have shared as uh, athletes and activists, but what your father's vision and what this organization does to impact our world through sports as well. 
Well, sports is something that is a common denominator people around the world can recognize and connect with. And we have to continue to level the playing field. Soccer is the most popular sport in the world. Why is it so expensive in the United States? Why are our children being excluded because of cost? I want you to look just beyond the field and beyond the court and look at the parents behind so many of these young men and women. These are high quality families and parents. We see the outliers, the extreme of those that have made it against the odds and their stories are absolutely inspiring and riveting. But this is who we are in the main, parents that have done all the right things with their children. And this is why going forward, we have to look at not just on the field, off the field, and up into the suites where these young men and women can use their true talent. Do you notice why they're having so many three points being hit in the NBA now? Because they've changed the rules. They're going back to the rules of the 1950s, Isaiah Thomas told me, where you can't hand check anybody, you can't do any contact. Because I know my friend Zeke would have scored a lot more points if you couldn't hold him and grab him. But the rules are changing and it's very subtle. These young men and women, when they have the owners to get together, they're excluded from those tables. They're excluded from when the rules and decisions are made on sponsorship, on corporate, on how the game can even be more accessible, more fun, more competitive. We want to continue to challenge to open the rules. When the NBA teams were sold and allocated, blacks were not allowed to borrow from banks. What's called redlining was absolutely financial racism. We have to raise our voice to continue to open the door. And let's always come to the aid of those that make a difference because there's a fierce wind that you don't see. There are all these people, half of these men and women size, who are the daughters and the granddaughters that have the purse strings that can tell a Magic Johnson to leave my team. That can tell a, a, a star that recruits the Golden State and Anthony Jackson to leave the team because they have the power. We, only want to, we not only want to play, we want to have the power into the future to set the industry on the right track. You know, what strikes me also, I talked to a number of sports analysts this weekend, and uh, from 33 to 45, blacks were banned from playing professional football. 12 years. Not commonly known. Uh, blacks who could won teams uh, were put off. People like Kendall Washington who played football with Jack Robinson was not, was not uh, recruited, but he was all American, all of that. Significant 12 years, 100 years celebration with a 12 year gap. But more than that, in 48, the Bears won the championship and lost $18,000 in the championship game. You could, buy, you could buy a franchise for $500,000. The water was low, we couldn't get across. Now we, we've made the sport this phenomenal global situation. So when, no matter on the field, on the court, there may be 10 black basketball players. Mm -hmm. Upset there are 32 white owners That's right. That's right. who call the shots. <laughs> and the last I would like to make this point is that uh, the reason why their giving back is so important, a honeybee is said to be brainless. There are no honeybee surgeons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't find a honeybee brain. But there, there, there's somebody, what did they, it's a honeybee, honeybee. It's, nectar it's nectar from flower. flower. It doesn't just fly away. Fly away. So you got mine, got, got yours to get. Yours it it drops, pollen. drops pollen, but it got nectar. It's so a flower, flower. can keep living. Keep so when, so when honeybee, honeybee runs, out, runs out, come back home, back home. And, get and get some more. So in some real sense, we, we must at least have, we must at least have Honeybee sense. Yes, Honeybee sense. It's, 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 it's significant to me that, in terms of the politics of it, they try to you know, be political. Almost all those owners support Trump. We look at tax breaks from Trump. Now, we, David was a great slingshot as, a, as, a, as an athlete. But he's not known for being a slingshot slinger. He beat Goliath. He's fighting for the people. It's a public policy struggle. Uh, so Samson and, and, and the Philistines. He's fighting for his people. They weren't just strong. He wasn't just strong in the abstract. 
flex his muscles, said, David, David was a political emancipator. And Samson, Samson. political emancipator. Athletes were blessed by God with an obligation, an obligation to lift the people that made them possible. Give these athletes a big hand, won't you? Captain Towns. <laughs>